Hello, good morning. Um, so my name is Brian Nisbet. I'm the Network Operations Manager in PGA Net, the Irish National Research and Education Network. This is an evolution um, by at least four or five of a lightning talk I did at TNC, which is the Academic Networking Conference in Prague last year. Um, it, it struck me that it was something we could talk a little bit more about, so I, I decided to do so. Um, so I'm the Network Operations Manager at HGA Net. I'm also involved in the, the um, NOC Special Interest Group in the academic uh, research uh, community. And uh, Christian would get very annoyed if I didn't mention the fact that I'm also on the program committee of INOG, the Irish Network Operators Group, which you should all come over and visit. Um, the next meeting is in March, and uh, we're also looking for speakers. So there you go, Christian. That's the plug. Um, so in my job, I spend a lot of time thinking about what makes my clients and my users happy, because really that's what I get paid for. Um, and I'm coming from this from the NREN perspective, absolutely, and I realize that there's, there's, there are a few NREN representatives uh, in this room, but most of you are commercial operators. But I think that what I'm saying is, and what I'll be talking about is, is very much applicable to all of you. And I'm kind of hoping that all of you know all of this already, and I'll just be going, yeah, yeah, we know that, Brian, we're doing that already. It's okay, you can sit down. But as Keith says, these meetings are all about the distribution of clue, and maybe I'll say something which is useful, sparks a conversation, or you go, ooh, well, yeah, we could do that, and, and you know, we're not doing enough of it or something like that. So hopefully this is, this is useful. So let's cast our minds back to, to a previous time, a more golden age, um, where some of, that some of you may well remember, and, and hopefully there are people in the room who don't remember because this industry needs new people. But Telnet was safe. Denial of service attacks were something that, yeah, ping of death maybe, but not really a thing. You know, we weren't constantly worried that hordes of security cameras were going to take down our networks and destroy all our services. It was just, it was a nicer time. And also, from the point of view of an NREN, certainly, we could do maintenance. We had a maintenance window which was 8 to 10 on a Wednesday morning, and we could basically do anything. Um, I was once working in a university where we needed extra time on that, told the, the, the operations manager down there, and he was like, yeah, it's fine. I'll just tell them the network won't be up until, until noon. Just think about doing that now. Um, so we have, still have all of these SLAs or SLOs, but that's a whole other talk for a, for a future time. Um, and, and we have them there, we have our SLAs, we have our maintenance windows, we have the amount of time that we feel our, whether it's a service, whether it's hosting, whether it's a link, whatever, can be down for. And what I'm really doing in this talk is turning around and saying, taking all of that, all of those nice shiny SLAs you have, all of the amount of time you think you can have things down for, and make it disappear and replace it with 60 seconds. So what's 60 seconds? What's our, what's our effective one minute SLA, which is, is a phrase we end up using a lot of? This is the time between the service going down and in our case, students realizing that their access to their VLE is gone, or more realistically, that Facebook hasn't refreshed. Um, so that's the amount of time you get between them going, could just be a glitch, to something is wrong, I'm now going to go on to Facebook on the supercomputer I have in my pocket connected to the other network and complain about it on Facebook or on Twitter or otherwise. Um, one of our clients suffered a power outage in one of their main buildings uh, just two weeks ago on the first day of their spring or winter exams, their January exams. And while there were no pictures, unfortunately, taken of the library, the Twitter feed certainly suggested that it had reduced to some pre-civilized age, um, where you know, people were, a, you know, were attacking each other for the last copy of a book in the library. Um, and this was all live, you know, live there on Twitter for all to see, including, of course, the president of the university. I hasten to point out, this was not our problem. Our network was fine. Unfortunately, their DNS server was less fine, which, which caused problems. So we live very much in a 24 by 7 age for learning as well as for commercial applications. And we hit this problem where certainly my clients have students all over the world. And they don't want an outage while 
their students in China, who are worth a lot of money to them, are trying to access their VLE. They don't want an outage while some of their researchers are doing some big job with, you know, we're, we're building an extra bit of the LOFAR radio telescope in Ireland now, which is fantastic, but we're going to have to be aware of that and the information it's sending forward and back. What it kind of boils down to is that nobody ever wants the service to be down, ever. Um, and their tolerance for that is reducing and reducing and reducing. And um, their tolerance for what they'll actually accept. Obviously, you ask them, nope, must stay up at all times. It actually goes down how long before they start ringing up the escalation chain. So, obviously, as I said, I say all of this from my academic ivory tower. Um, but, and I have my experiences and my students and my users. But what are we looking at from a commercial world? Now, I've never worked for a commercial ISP. But I've talked to a lot of you, and you seem like nice people. Um, and you've told me things about your worlds, strange and unusual as they are, for profit as they are, um, allegedly. But um, it does this apply to you? And I think, I think obviously, you know, yes, it, yes, it does. Um, now, we'll talk about different classes of users and different things you can do through it. But one of the things that I was th thinking about a lot in, in, um, when I was writing this talk initially was how ISPs differ. And I have 61 clients. Uh, I can't really afford to lose those, uh, those clients before you know, people start to notice that suddenly half of the universities in the country are going somewhere else. Um, can you afford to lose a home DSL client? Yes, certainly the first few. Um, can you afford to lose a small, medium enterprise? Yeah, probably the first few. Can you afford to lose a big enterprise? Eh. Can you afford to lose what I would refer to as a hyper-mega global corporation? Probably not, if that's what you're building your business around. And we, we deal with those 61 clients, and we very much, you know, we care for them, we feed them, we give them all the information, all the communication, I'll be coming back to that. Whereas in the commercial world, you have things like the AWS status page, um, which is one of the greatest works of fiction of all time. <laughs> Now, on the flip side of that, I was looking, browsing Twitter, as I do, and, and, um, uh, of a Sunday evening, last Sunday evening, and I saw Mythic Beasts apologizing for not providing a suitable level of service at um, half 11 on a Sunday evening, um, and prostrating themselves in front of their customers. So, you know, it, it very much goes from one side to the other. But what I was saying was, you know, can we even have downtime anymore? Can we, can we have service maintenance? And, and obviously, this poor dog, the symbol, the, the, the mascot of 2016, um, seems like a, a very useful way of talking about this. It's also a great explanation of technical debt. We sit there as, as things go on around us, and, and this is fine. This has to be fine, because we've been told the network and the services must stay up. Um, but the big challenge, and certainly the challenge for me, and I expect the challenge for a lot of you, is persuading senior stakeholders that this world just can't persist, that maintenance has to take place. And if it doesn't take place, it's only going to go horribly wrong at some future unknown time. Um, and I think that's the first big challenge. And the first thing that, that you have to think about as operators is how do you, how do you persuade those stakeholders that um, this is necessary. And I think we as engineers certainly tend to think of this far too much in the case of, of, of from an engineering point of view. From a, well, you know, this, this thing has happened, this other thing, you know, we need to do this. Of course we need to do upgrades. Of course we need to, to upgrade the software or otherwise. And of course, your senior stakeholders may once have been engineers or may never have gone near the command line interface of a router or, or a, a, a server. So it's changing that language and being aware of that and talking about the appetite for risk versus what they're going to spend money on. Um, when we rolled out our, the latest version of our optical network, we'd initially put one node per, one optical node per site because that is what the people who are ultimately funding this had agreed to pay for. They were, you know, Advarotum nodes, two shelves, so a certain amount of resilience in there, but there was only one pair per location and one pair university, effectively speaking, was the, was the backbone in Dublin and around the rest of the country. 
And everyone was perfectly happy with that and they certainly weren't willing to pay any more money for, for any more resilience. And then, for reasons, the power was lost to one of these nodes in one of the universities. Uh, the entire university went offline. And suddenly, people were really willing to spend extra money on more resilience. I mean, I couldn't possibly have imagined this situation. Um, so it's, it's talking about that. It's talking about the risk versus budget. It's talking about the, the thing between known outage now for a set period of time versus unknown outage at a later point in time, which could be in five seconds' time, could be in three months' time. But if it does go down, it's going to take a lot longer to come back than if it was a planned piece of work. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's the, big, the big argument there. And I mean, resilience is such a huge part of all of this, um, but it's your, it's your really large kind of winning argument. Um, so we talked about clients. This is the marketing. All clients are equal. We love all of our clients. They're all amazing. Probably closer to the reality of how much time and money we spend on them and what the, we, sorry, I'm suddenly talking like I'm a commercial ISP. It's, it's very strange. It's the room. It's the atmosphere. Um, all of my clients are equal. You have your home users, the small little blue section there, SME, the red one, big enterprise, your green one, and then your hyper mega global corporations, the other side. And how much time you spend on those, how much time you spend on monitoring them, how much time you, you give to them when you're... Um, when you have outages, when you have problems, what effort you put into restoring that. And obviously, you've got to have your own hierarchy, but it's worth really thinking about this um, and worth putting this into your thinking. Maybe not telling the home user what the story is, but certainly make sure you have a plan um, and you're aware of what's going on. So given all of these circumstances, given the fact that we have these problems, um, we have people who don't want downtime ever, people who are less willing to spend money on various things, and users who are becoming less and less tolerant of outages um, at any time of the day because they could, be, they could be doing things with Netflix at any time of the day. Um, they could be posting to Facebook at any time of the day. Um, they could be doing super important work stuff, again, at any time of the day, and that's it's increasingly the way we are no matter what time zone we're in. So what can we do? I'm going to state a whole bunch of obvious things now, which I hope, again, you're all saying, yeah, of course. Resilience. As much as you can get everywhere you can get it. Now, this doesn't, I'm not suggesting that every home user gets two DSL links via geographically diverse pops. Um, if someone's willing to pay for it, absolutely. Um, but how much resilience, how much failover can you build into your network? Can you put in place there to, to solve what is going to be 90% of your problems, power outage and a pop. Um, so you've got your UPSs, you've got your generators, et cetera, et cetera. Are the power feeds set up properly to deal with that? What happens if that pop goes down? What reroutes? How does that go? Again, these are all things that we all know, but sometimes people do a shocking job of actually implementing them. Um, and this is not just about links. This is about services. Virtual machines are cheap and easy. Um, you can run them on Raspberry Pis, people keep on telling me. Um, so put them in place, stick a load balancer in front of, uh, in front of them, and, and you've, you know, he says very glibly, um, you tell them I'm not a sysadmin, um, you just stick, put them in place, get them running, you've got that service resilience. And you don't need to have lots of tin in lots of different locations. Just thinking about what the options here are, and the, the resilient one doesn't have to be maybe quite as shiny and as powerful, although I would strongly recommend it should be, as the main one. Um, you, can, uh, you can put that in place quite comfortably to, to get that. And that's the front end. It's the back end as well. There's no point in someone getting to a website if they can't access the database that's behind it. Um, and bear in mind, all of your users have resilience. They have these supercomputers in their pockets, which, if they're not connected to their own Wi-Fi, can connect to the 4G network or otherwise it's there. And what you don't want, unless you are, of course, a mobile operator, is your users going, 4G is more reliable, faster speeds than what I'm paying for in my, in my broadband here. I could just stop paying for this fixed line. Um, you know, what, what happens there and what's your, what's, what's your problem there? Um, 
I foolishly didn't hit my timer. How am I doing for time? Sorry. Okay, okay. Look, lots of time. Okay, wow. Um, and importantly with this, it's testing that resilience. There is no point in going, look at our glorious, amazing piece of resilience, isn't it beautiful? And then something breaks and the resilience is not beautiful. It is not there. And importantly, especially if you're providing service um, to a DMARC point for a client, just because you've tested that resilience once doesn't mean they haven't done something which will then make that resilience break or indeed cause some sort of weird behavior in their own network um, where their site has connectivity but certain bits of it can't reach the other, the other route out um, either. So you've got to talk to your clients, you've got to be aware of this and you've got to test it. And you've got to test it fairly often or at least frequently um, as a part of your process and make sure that you can never sign off on resilience until you've done that failover testing at all of the possible levels and try and work through as many of the failure modes as possible. Hmm. Huh. Weird. Okay. I thought. Anyway, so there's supposed to be now a slide of a really cheesy picture of um, a human hand fist bumping a robot hand because it was the cheesiest automation picture I could find. Um, easily online. Automation. There have been so many talks about this recently and I could spend a long time talking about it. But automation is a, is a key way, not just of getting your build right in the first place, but also of service restoration when something does go down. Honestly, we need to trust computers more. We trust them for lots of things, but there is still, and there will be ongoing, this lingering distrust over Oh, well, the computer might suddenly restart the wrong daemon at the wrong time. Only if you tell it to. Um, it might configure this wrongly. Again, only if you tell it to. So we have to be happier with network build via automation. Having our database network, the, the, the network should not be the, the configuration database. Have it somewhere else. Put it in Git, whatever else you want to do there. Just your live network should not be your configuration database. Um, you should not be doing things by hand, carved into the command line, unless it is some sort of super emergency. And you should be thinking seriously about having systems that sit there and just restart demons if they fail. The people who are running massive, massive networks, Facebooks, Netflixes, all of these things with ridiculous uptime requirements, they're doing that. Now, I'm not saying you can suddenly turn your, your ISP with three people working for it into, into a Facebook network, nor am I suggesting you should. But if people who have this kind of level of uptime are doing it, then maybe you can think about it. And also, maybe that will make your people who are on call happier. On call, which I do, I think probably most of the people in this room do, is fundamentally evil and bad for us. And um, we haven't found a way around it yet, but it is fundamentally evil and bad for us. To be woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning is bad for you. So if you can have a computer that can fix the problem before you have to get paged, surely that's a good thing. Processes. Um, I'm now going to go into a one-hour tutorial on idle. Um, <laughs> control and change. Uh, Change management, incident management, vitally, vitally important. I don't care what process you use. I don't care if it's idle. I don't care if it's some ISO thing, whatevs. Um, the important point is to have one, to define your process, you apply it, communicate externally and internally about it, refine it all, communicate some more, keep on going. Have a process. Know what to do when you're changing something. And know what to do when something breaks. Change management is a particularly strange thing. Uh, engineers generally hate it, especially ones who've been around for a while, because they remember the time when they could just make changes on the core without having to go through a form in triplicate. Um, and it would probably be fine 99% of the time, or 98 or 85 or 50. Sure, flip a coin. Um, and now we're going, no, 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 you have to have this. We have to have a paper trail whereby we can see who did what, when, and what the rollback plan was. Rollback plans, people, rollback plans. Um, so, and I also find that engineers tend to, again, resist initially, and then 
tend to accept it, tend to actually get quite used to it eventually because it gives them that structured thinking. They have to write the whole thing down, plan it out, and also it gives them a level of cover because they've gone through this process. It's been, especially if it's a serious change, been approved by somebody else. Other people have looked at it. Um, they have done more than discuss it with the duck on their desk. It's a positive thing. And it leads into better incident management because it's much easier to build that vital, blame-free incident management culture if you have those other controls and structures and covers for your engineers. And the blame-free part of any incident management system is absolutely vital. If you go into an incident management situation where people are expected to have their heads bitten off, no one is going to volunteer any information, no one's going to talk openly. They're going to be worse at their job and it's going to be the fault of the culture or the management, the manager who runs that or otherwise. Um, and the two things work really closely hand in hand. So, as I said, I don't care what the processes are. I care that you have them. I care that someone, preferably a number of you, have sat down, have talked through them, have put them in place, and have made sure that you've got senior management buy-in to tell all the engineers and to tell the various people all the way down that they have to do this. This isn't something they can skip. This isn't something they can ignore. It has to happen or, I mean, there will be some consequences. We talk about blame free. That's the incident management part of it. Not actually writing a change request and just doing the thing anyway should have some blame attached to it, I think, personally, he says, speaking as a manager. Um, also be aware, though, when you talk about processes, if you're some giant company which is monolithic and when it takes 17 days and 500 euro to change a DNS entry, then you can probably live with quite static, slow processes. If you're a small, dynamic company, then your processes have to suit that and suit your client needs and make sure that your clients don't feel the processes are impinging on their ability to get something done. So there's a balance there, and it's whatever will work right for you. Um, Communication, communication, more communication. This is what clients want. This is what users want when something breaks. Um, if you are not communicating with them, they are assuming you are not fixing the problem and they are going to get pissed off at you. It's that straightforward. And if you communicate with them, then they will go, oh, they're working. So, and you've got to think about this from the client point of view. And this is one of the places where the AWS status page falls down because they look at something and go, well, it's only a minor problem, but it actually affects this other thing, which is huge to the users. So you've got to think about this from your user's point of view, not from an engineering point of view. It's what is actually affecting their service. And then talk about it. If you're big and you have your social, you know, if you have social media um, channels going on, make sure the people who are working those know what's going on. There are far too many ISPs who have social media people who will repeat the same thing over and over, even though the user base knows there's a real technical problem, but no one's updated them, so they keep on asking people to reboot their router. And this will only get your clients, your users, annoyed. So it will get you understanding, it will get you, you know, it, it will help, and it will give you more time to fix this problem. And ultimately, clients, users won't leave if they feel you've been doing, or be less likely to leave, if they feel you've been doing your best to communicate with them. Um, you're providing comfort. You're, you're talking to them. And again, with all of this, the first strike of something going, going offline is rarely fatal. The fifth time, however, something breaks, no one communicates, or they get the same can't answer, otherwise it's a very different story. So we started this talking about 60 seconds and how that's what you have, because users expect their service to work all the time now. It's that straightforward, and unfortunately, if you got into this industry and are only realizing that now, sorry, uh, we hope you enjoy your stay. You've got to look at that, look at different things. Home broadband users, uh, this race to the bottom price-wise is not doing anyone any favors, um, and it's, it's this whole thing. Do you even get any profit out of a home broadband user? After they pick up the phone once, you send one tweet, is that it? Um, but as you work up, as you look at the small office, look at SMEs, et cetera, et cetera, you need to, to be doing everything you can. And I don't mean to neglect home broadband users. I am one. Uh, I prefer if everyone did, but it's, again, that question, that balance of cost versus, versus return. Um, 
and enterprise users and up, they, they just assume it's always going to work. It's always going to work. It's always going to be there. Their services are always going to be there. And you as a recipient of their cash have to be able to provide that. But with some of the things we've talked about, with processes, with understanding and good levels of communication between stakeholders, change management, instant management, and most importantly, communication, that 60 seconds can actually be stretched by quite a bit, um, and it will do you and your users a lot of benefit. Thank you very much. Okay, any questions for Brian? Uh, okay, we have Dave. Thank you. Hi, uh, Dave Friedman from Clarinet. Uh, thank you very much. That was a very good presentation. I just have a question. Is there any advocacy for automated systems which post status message updates? Hi, we're aware of a problem and on our looking at it, even if we're not aware of it and not looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, this, this is the thing. There's a, lot to be, there's a lot to be said, in my head, certainly, for that kind of automation, but only if it's followed up by people actually looking at it. And when I talk about communication, I'm assuming you're telling the truth. Uh, so certainly, yes, if you're at that stage of things, and automatic status pages and stuff like that, you know, that go through just possibly through the social media, certainly, yeah, that may well be worthwhile, but it's got to be backed up by, by actual action as well. Sure. Thank you. It made perfect sense to everybody else. Okay, thank you very cool. much, Brian. Thank you.